Good morning. Are we on? We're on. We're I think live. We're on. We're Excellent. Live. Well, we're here for a jump start. We're going to be doing a jump start on building web applications with ASP.NET and HTML5, JavaScript, all kinds of great stuff. Absolutely. And I'm going to just mouth, mouth along. Right. <laughs> Do not die on me. Okay, uh, let's switch over to the slides and dig in. Okay, so um, we're going to start out. This is Scott. You may have met. You may have seen this person speak before. Hello. I have a little bit less hair than that picture. I have about the same amount of hair as in this picture. <laughs> um, we also have a special guest star, uh, Damian Edwards, who will be popping in a little bit. Um, so he is uh, Mr. SignalR, a bunch of other great stuff. Mm -hmm. He's going to talk about some web forms things, some SignalR. He will back me up if I fall over. Right. Stunt double. So here's, here's an overview of what we're going to be looking at today. Um, so uh, we've got a busy, action-packed day. Uh, and so we'll just kind of jump in. Target audience. Right. So the general idea here, I think, would be fair to say, would be that you've got some experience developing, mm -hmm. uh, maybe 200 to 300 level content. But uh, you, ha you are familiar. You know what HTML is. We're not going to go and start it, you know, file a new project and say, right. this is an angle bracket. So yeah. there, there is an assumption that you know something. Uh, you can go and check out some of the previous jump starts and learn about uh, HTML5 and JavaScript if you want to. Remember, if you are going through this jump start, you find that it's either too advanced or not advanced enough. Check out one of the other ones. Uh, and if you feel that you're not ready for this jump start, check out one of the previous ones. This one is recorded. Yep. Some of you are watching it live, but most of you are actually watching this in the future. Hello, future citizens. Hello, future people. Hope yep. that it's very sunny. Uh, so, you know, you've got the choices. Yeah, great. Okay, and then there's this MVA community. Um, so join the virtual academy. A million registered users, over a billion served. That's exciting. And um, so, and if if you, uh, I guess, if you enter this magical code, it gets you Xbox points. It gets Is that you. True? No, it does not. MVA points, almost as good. They're 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 Microsoft Virtual Academy Chivos. Yes. Yes, you get experience points. Okay. All right, so let's talk a little bit about ASP.NET as a general concept and just lay some foundational concepts. Right, right. Okay. Um, so, so this is this is what's going to be in our in our uh, first session. I'm going to hop over. Actually, that is still in that one. Yep. Okay. <clears throat> so we're going to talk about web forms. Yep. Initially, but. We're not just talking about web forms, but also some of the core foundational services that you're going to need to use. Because there's a number of uh, things that are built into Visual Studio 2012 for web developers uh, that you're going to need to understand if you're going to want to be a successful ASP.NET developer. Right. And then at the end, we'll talk about some things that uh, are cross-cutting across ASP.NET, like bundling and optimization. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. So in order to do web development, you're going to need to understand Visual Studio. You'll need to understand NuGet. There's ASP.NET itself, kind of the core foundational services. And then we, we like Azure for our cloud services. Mm -hmm. So in, in some of the instances, we'll be deploying to Azure. So Visual Studio 2012 has made some really, really cool improvements for uh, web development. We're going to take a look at some of those features. We'll look at HTML5, CSS3 standards, how Visual Studio supports that, as well as some of the older standards. There's a number of things going on around JavaScript uh, and improvements in 2012 that we'll look at. Some really neat things happened in 2012.2 which is our recent release just, just on, a few days ago. Just a couple just days Monday, ago. Yeah. If this is February, a couple days ago. Yeah. If this is June when you're watching this, then it was months ancient, ago and you're behind. Ancient past, yeah. Uh, in the page inspector, we'll take a yeah. look at that. Also, the fact that you get to write HTML, CSS, JavaScript, Razor, C Sharp, VB, all in the same Visual Studio editor. Right. Client, same editor for client and server. Then we'll talk about NuGet. NuGet is our package manager. NuGet is how you bring your dependencies in for your projects. And uh, it handles versioning, it handles dependency checking. If I said I wanted jQuery UI, it would bring in jQuery. Right. We want to make sure people know about NuGet. Which, you know, and that's part of the reason we wanted to talk about that this morning, which is um, this is fundamental. This is part of how you develop in, in Visual Studio. This is how you develop web applications today. So, you know, we need to talk about, you need to know this. Um, we talk to web developers from time to time, and they're not aware that they're, NuGet, they're using NuGet when they do file new projects. Right, exactly. And, and NuGet's actually in all the SKUs now. You can find it everywhere. NuGet's in the phone SKU, and it's in the Windows Store SKU. Yeah, so it's just it's a fundamental thing, and you need to get to know it. It really handles, that, like you were talking about, the versioning and uh, dependencies. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a cool thing that you mentioned there with um, 
like jQuery. A lot of people would think that NuGet is only for uh, assembly, isn't bringing in an assembly, but really, if you want, say, jQuery validation or jQuery UI, well, those require jQuery, mm -hmm. and so that whole dependency management is just really great with JavaScript as well. Exactly. So then moving forward into the framework itself, uh, you're gonna be creating websites and or web services. Mm -hmm. Services can be old style web services, what we used to call ASMX web services that ship um, XML, or REST style, REST style services that do JavaScript or XML, things like that. The green boxes there kind of give you a sense of the, the cafeteria that is ASP.NET. You've got a number of choices. You've got web forms for control-based and event-based abstractions, mm -hmm. web pages for very light kind of PHP style pages using the Razor syntax. You've got MVC and Web API. And then on top of those is layered the support for things like single page applications that we'll dig into. Right. And then we've got SignalR, which is real-time communication. And we'll talk about including support for things like WebSockets. Now, we just talked about this, 2012.2. This is ASP.NET and Web Tools 2012 Update 2. This came out on Monday, if Monday, I remember correctly. Yeah. This actually adds new templates to Visual Studio. This is an interesting one because it's not necessarily runtime, change your machine level. Things. Right, right. It didn't install new things into the global assembly cache, and it's not going to break your applications. Instead, it adds new features when you say file new project. Mm -hmm. You've got things like SignalR available. You have the Facebook application, new improvements in MVC. That's built into 2012.2. No changes to the ASP.NET runtime. That's time. a huge thing. So, so if Scott had 2012.2 uh, and I didn't have it installed, he could do file new project. He could email me that application. I could open it on my machine. And it would be just fine. So there's no changes to the project file. There's no changes to the runtime. I don't need any changes on my server to upload it. It's, mm -hmm. just, it's just file new project changes to those templates and things. But it includes um, NuGet packages. Right. So kind of calling back to NuGet, uh, we've updated jQuery, jQuery UI, and all those things are versions. And then, of course, after you've got this installed on your system, you can go and update as well. Right. If a new version of jQuery comes out tomorrow, you can update that on NuGet. So then if I want to deploy these to Azure, then what? Yeah, so uh, we're we've got a whole, uh, kind of at the end of the day, we're working through building things, and at the end of the day, we've got a session on uh, deploying to the cloud. What I like to think about as a web developer is you're not really a web developer if all you ever did was file a new project and run it on your machine, right? You only become a web developer when you actually put your applications up on the web. And so what I like about Azure websites is you get 10 sites for free, and you can deploy all day long. You know, you can spin up a site for QA or for sharing something with your friend, or you know, just to kind of work on it and see how does my application work when I actually put it on the internet. Um, yeah. And signing up for that's free. So what does that look like when you sign I, up? For actually, it? I've moved that to the end of the day. I figured that would be a little more fun. Oh, even better. Yep. That's fantastic. OK. okay. So, okay, so we've talked about those foundational tools. Yep. Visual Studio, NuGet, all running on the ASP.NET runtime, and then Azure we'll talk about a little bit later in the day. Right. So then after that, we're going to look at building some things on top of those. So some key scenarios, once we've got this core foundation, we've got HTML5, HTTP services with Web API. Uh, and this one, this one I know is going to surprise you. This is a kind of surprise thing I've got for you, but it's apps for Office. So yeah, I'm going right. yeah. to try and dazzle you with my apps for Office fun. And then mobile. I know you're mm -hmm. gonna, yeah, you're we're talking mobile. about mobile. We're talking about jQuery mobile, getting these things to run on tablets and phones. Yep. Uh, we have social applications, social login, and also Facebook applications. Mm -hmm. And then finally, real time which is with SignalR. Very cool. And of course, people can give feedback. They can uh, go onto the chat. Exactly. And yeah. we will ignore you. <laughs> Which is We're excited, great. and we also have uh, Damien's online on the on the chat. I think Brady is online. We've got some MVPs as well. So please do get your questions in, and they'll bounce some to us if they think they're you know worthy of some fun on the air. Um, that's that for that. So the, you know the main idea with the overview is just to make sure that you know the fundamentals and to explain to you what we're going to be talking about today. All right, cool. So let's talk about what's new. What is new? So this is in. Uh, this is that core of ASP.NET. You talked about one ASP.NET. Mm -hmm. So we're going to be talking about what is new in all of that ASP.NET core. Um, so that puts us right here. In all right. Map. So ASP.NET, sometimes people feel like it's a fork in the road. You go file a new project, and then you got to pick one. They forget that you can have web forms and MVC and web pages all working together. Right. So we're going to try to do that in a lot of our demos. We'll talk about some of the improvements in web forms in this particular module, but we'll notice that a lot of these things 
came over from NBC. So we're seeing cross-pollination right. happening between these different And even in some ways, there's some things moving over from, you know, web pages or web forums into NBC as well. It's, it's you know, these are, this, this is, people used to joke about that there's the MVC developers at one table in the cafeteria hall, right? And then there's the web forums and they're kind of throwing things and Yeah, well, and there's a whole East Coast, West Coast, right, right. Biggie Tupac thing between web forums and MVC. And it's just not necessary. It's, it's just the silly. same devs. <laughs> yeah, it's well, devs. It's true. It's the same devs. Sometimes split personality on the same day. Right, right. So here's our module overview of what we're covering in this. Um, we're looking at some new features for web forms. Uh, we'll be looking then at, um, and friendly URLs, part of that 2012.2 release. Uh, we also have uh, some Visual Studio tooling we'll be looking at with Page Inspector, like you said, uh, web editor features, web essentials, and uh, bundling and optimization. So I'm going to dive right into web forms and looking at strongly typed data controls. Um, this is something that came out in August of last year with ASP.NET 4.5. And this is a really, this is something I've been doing web forms development as, as have a lot of us for a long time. and, and uh, this is so, this fixes a problem I ran into over and over, which is you would all your bindings were in quotes. So mm. you would say, you know, I want to data bind to something, and you put your quotes and you misspell first name, and you don't know it until you actually browse to that. Because it, it felt like magic strings, right? I mean, you have yeah. a data binding expression, and you say like eval, and then quote right. first name, you misspell first. Whole thing falls apart, and you have no way. You rename it, and you look at that page, and you have no way of knowing what's wrong. Right. Right. So. Uh, with this, any data aware control, you'll set an item type to something like you know customer, and then in the page you can do item dot first name last name. You get IntelliSense, you get type checking, and you get that compilation error. You get the little red squiggly if it's mm -hmm. if it's not correct. Uh, secondly, there's support for model model binding. Um, the way that data you get data and update data is really nice. So instead of when the page loads, setting um, properties. So you know, my my data grid dot data source equals this, and you know, or or my name equals text name dot whatever. <coughs> this is actually you're you're using methods. So you're saying that my repeater gets its information from a select method, and then that select method just returns like an iQueryable. And this is interesting because you'll notice that there's no object data source. Right, you know, it's, it's it's a simpler way, and especially for people who are using the repository pattern, mm -hmm. they have get customers, insert customer, update customers, and things like that. They can have select method, insert method, and they can pull most, if not all, of that out of their code behind. Right. Yeah, that's that's a great feature. Is that this this uh, queryable method here? In this case, we're showing binding to a control, but in uh, most of my web forms, uh, get select methods and, and update methods and things like that. If I if I showed you that code, you'd have no way of knowing it was in a web forms application. You can share this code between web forms and MVC, um, so it really gives you a lot of flexibility and it gives you a lot cleaner code. And another really important point for people who are on web forms today, if you're using web forms three five and you've moved to four or you're on four. .NET 4.5 is almost like a service pack. It's an in-place upgrade for 4.0. You can put this on your machine, and then on a page-by-page -page basis, if you choose to opt in to these features, it won't break your existing Web Forms app, but you can change it. So for people who like Web Forms, they feel productive in Web Forms, but maybe they're thinking, oh, I'm going to move to MVC because that's what the new kids are doing. Mm -hmm. They may be able to find that. Well, they can have their repository pattern, and they can you know, do iQueryable and do chaining link queries and things like that. You know, that's a great point. And I talk to people about how you, know, how you migrate a project from web forms to MVC or how a team that has web forms and MVC development, or you know, if you work on both throughout the day, how, how you can make those things work smoothly together. My number one recommendation is get on ASP.NET 4.5 and use this new data binding method um, because the syntax is the same. And then the code is the same, and it's easier to jump back and forth. If you do web forms like this for a bit and you hop into MVC, it's really pretty easy. All right, web forms friendly URLs. So this actually started life as a NuGet package, I believe. So this was interesting. This was done by uh, Milan Lipton, and it was called Smarty Routes. But I think the lawyers said we couldn't call it Smarty Routes. <laughs> it ended up being friendly URLs. And this was the idea that a lot of people have put in work to um, do things like URL rewriting to mm -hmm. hide the .aspx extension, right? because cool URLs don't have that extension. Uh, and then that kind of graduated into uh, this, this much even smartier smarty routes called friendly URLs, and now it's baked in to ASP.NET. 
and uh, it lets you do some interesting things. Yeah, so, uh, you know, not only does it, I was doing this URL rewriting as were we all for a, for a long time, and, it, and, it, and it's difficult because it didn't really map smoothly you had to kind of figure out where you came from and, and it didn't really, the two, it wasn't built to work that way. Um, so what's nice with this friendly URL is it, it all kind of maps together. It uses the routing system, the same routing system that's, that's um, in MVC. And it also uses this control binding. So in a URL, like um, in, in my sample on the slide here, we've got a URL uh, a slash album slash edit slash one and that's ID is actually passed to controls. So a control to, can bind to that. So I'm actually, I'm going to jump over into some, some code. Time to first demo, not too bad today. That's pretty decent. What is that, about 10 minutes, first demo? Yeah. <laughs> so, okay, so here I've got a, and I'm actually, I brought in the, from the MVC Music Store, I brought over the... Um, okay, well, hang on. Is this MVC or web forms we're looking at here? This is web forms. Okay. Yep. So I brought in models from the MVC Music Store. Mm. So I've got a bunch of, you know, just simple classes that I'm going to be binding to. Those are my models. Okay. So now if I go to default.aspx, the first thing I want to point out here is I've got an item type. So my item type I've defined at the top. And then when I'm binding to it, this is a uh, list view. And so here I've got item dot, right? And I can go into, I've got title and ID mm. and all that kind of stuff, right? So. Um, I think I had title here. So the list view knows about your, uh, that you're talking about albums. This is kind of a for loop control. It is, yeah. And what's nice here, this is uh, album dot, or this is album ID. Mm -hmm. So if I hit dot here, you know, I'm going to get IntelliSense. This knows it's an int. Right, so inside of the binding control, the binding expression, you're getting IntelliSense. Right, so I'm actually, I'll just run this right now and we'll take a look at what it does. So this is going to be, uh, accessing the data and it's going to be displaying it in a loop and then it's going to link over to another page. And what's important here, of course, is we're talking about friendly URLs as well. And so we'll want those URL links to be slash album slash ID and, and not have kind of a, you know, question mark, ASPX, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So here, actually, the reason that it was taken a second there is it's populating the database. It's right, because in this method. particular thing, you have a seed method. Right. So you ran that for the first time. It had no um, data. Data at all. So just no made So I click on the minute work there, because okay. I know we all listen to minute work. Right. Not at all. Um, <laughs> so we've got slash album slash edit slash one. Yep. So if I were running MVC, I would think to myself, oh, you're on the album controller. Right. the edit method. How do I know what page that is. Right, so in this, I've actually got slash album slash edit, and this this uses those uh, same, synth, it uses conventions, so this mm -hmm. is saying that this is, it's going to look in a slash album folder, and then for edit.aspx. Ah, okay. So here I've got that edit.aspx, and again, I've got this item type set. And oh, I've it's got, getting, you've got select method and update method. Yep, and actually, that's that's great. Let's look at the select method, so if I go into so the code behind here. Now the code behind in the past for web forms has looked a little bit, uh, it's like a little, little scary. busy. Yeah, a little busy. So here we've got my select method is like get item, and this aside from ignore for a second this friendly URLs, right? This friendly URL segments, you would not know that this is what kind of application this is in. This could be a console app. So this is just returning one of them. And if we go back actually um, in the code behind for the default.aspx. Um, that one as well, this one is even more anonymous. This is just returning a... So wait a second, that's the whole code behind? That's, yes, just that's that it. Just that one line, basically, the take 10. That is it. So that's to page, it does 10 at a time. And what's nice about this is that if you're at work and you've got some projects that have MVC and some projects that have web forms, you can share code, put things into a repository, right. put that in another DLL, Yep. go to town. So the one last thing I want to finish with is this, uh, this friendly URL segment. So we're, we're on this page where we've got an album edit ID. So we've got album one. And we need to get that ID, that number one ID, to a control. Mm -hmm. So you know it's not just the, the page that needs to know it. We need to pass that to the control. So in the past, you might have had to say, on the page load, let's go set the ID of this to this. Or you need to save that ID of one somewhere. What's nice is we're able to bind to this right here. So album edit, friendly URL segments, and it's going to look for an optional uh, integer, and it's going to use that ID. 
So, you know, this could, we could also bind to cookies or, you know, whatever that is. Uh, of course, I'd need to stop running. So, but, but uh, that allows that binding to work with anything as well as URL segments. That's pretty slick. So I could have, I can make my query strings clean. I don't necessarily even have to say question mark ID equals right. query string cookie forms. Could I write my own? You could. Dig it out of the header somewhere. Yeah, you can write your own bindings. And, uh, you know, one thing, a question that's come up to me several times is, well, will this work with my old URLs? Or is this going to break my old URLs? And mm -hmm. it, it still works with the old URLs. So you can kind of slowly migrate over if you have old links in place. Very cool. Very cool. Let's talk about bundling and optimization. Yeah, so bundling and optimization is an interesting one. You know, web pages have all these external references. You've got CSS and images and JavaScript and whatever you're loading. So this is a little uh, timeline that's mm -hmm. showing the browser going and loading those things. And then bundling, there's two, there's two levels here. There's bundling and then there's minification. Right. Okay. So bundling would take these things and say, well, here I've got five CSS files. I'm going to bundle those up into one single CSS file. And you know, if you uh, if you look on the network diagnostics, you know, and any, if you're any web browser, any modern web, web browser, you hit F12 and you get those web page tools, and you'll see all these network requests. So when a page is slow to load, there's a reason for that, and a lot of the time it's because one HTML file, you know, one page is actually 90 requests. <laughs> you know, it's a ton of different. I need this image, I need this JavaScript, and I need this JavaScript, mm -hmm. and I need that. And so just bundling those together says instead let's instead of getting 90 different JavaScript requests, let's figure this out and just get one. Right, and it's surprising how many sites that you'll go to. Uh, where you'll go and do a view source, and you'll realize that they're, they're not doing any of that. No. <laughs> and it's, it's such an easy thing to do. And one of the, the funny things that uh, you can use to find out whether you need to do this is you ask yourself, are the HTTP headers bigger than the thing you are requesting? <laughs> right. Because so often now we're using things like CSS sprites. Mm -hmm. We're bringing down PNGs and icons and tiny little chunks of JavaScript and tiny little pieces of an image, right? And then it's maybe 200 bytes, 300 bytes. But then you have a giant cookie, or you have the authentication cookie, or whatever, and right. suddenly the header is actually bigger than the body of the request. So, so what you're saying is each of those requests can be a big thing. And some people, you know, you have to go to the extent of like using a different image server, so a cookieless image server, all those things. Mm -hmm. Or you could just, you know, bundle and just make one request for each one. Right. Exactly. And this is why we use things like Why Slow mm -hmm. to to test our systems and see whether or not these are uh, these are working well. Yeah. So. Bundling and optimization is now built into ASP.NET, works both in web forms and uh, MVC. It's, it's an yeah. ASP.NET thing. So when we talk about core services, you get these kinds of things for free. Now, that's bundling. Bundling takes a number of CSS files and makes them one. Then minification then compresses them. Right. But it doesn't necessarily compress them with gzip. Okay, yeah. we're assuming that you're already doing that. And that's another thing to watch out for. You know, are your static files being compressed? Mm -hmm. But what minification does is it removes white space, which is interesting. It changes the values of your variables. Mm -hmm. If you've got a variable that's local and it's like, this is a really descriptive name for this variable, that can just be A at runtime. Yeah. Right? It's almost like the obfuscation that we see sometimes in .NET. But then you've got uh, removal of comments. Mm -hmm. And the convention is that you'd have foo.js and then you'd have foo.min.js. And I used to do this with pre-build scripts, right? I would have a batch file that would run, yeah. and I'd use like Ajax min dot exe. You know, did you, did you do that? Right, right, all this, yeah. Um, but you know, it's it's a it's something you've got to figure out. It's, you've got to keep it up to date. You've got to run it. You've got to do that pre-build before deploying. Mm -hmm. So uh, so with minification, well, I I talked to the. Um, to Howard about this, he was explaining that you know what they actually got this from Web Grease. If you look at your uh, NuGet packages or your references, Web Grease actually came over from I believe the MSN team. So, so Howard is the PM for yes, Bundling. Howard Durking. And and Web Grease is the is that a code name? Uh, that's yeah, I guess so. It's the, it's what it was internally before it became officially released as part of ASP.NET bundling and minification or mm -hmm. web optimization, I guess. Web optimization. Yeah. So um, so, but this is something that they used in production for a long time, and finally they said, why can't we ship this? And so, this is something that they have used. They've kind of battle tested it, and so the, those steps of minification are actually 
pretty intense. Like they actually do, like they have a parser in there, a lexical parser, the antler parser, and they go through and they, you know, actually understand the meaning of the JavaScript and CSS. So they can say, we can compress this CSS mm -hmm. to this equivalent syntax and stuff. Right. And if you don't like the way the minification happens, mm -hmm. you can plug in your own. Because there's a lot of opinions about these kinds of things, right. about how, what the right way to do this is. But let's, let's take a look at um, some code. Okay. So we're going to hop over to your machine we'll for We'll hop this, over right? to my machine here. So uh, this, this is 2012, and uh, I've actually I plugged in a, a little extension. I didn't tell you this. This is um, a, a, a nightly build of an extension from Ala Shaban from the editor team. Called, what could go wrong? What could go wrong? <laughs> it's called Navigate 2. Okay. Remember Navigate 2, but it's yeah. Navigate 2.2. Two. It's like <laughs> two dot two. <laughs> uh, navigate T O two, I think it is. Okay. But basically, you know, when you hit Control comma mm -hmm. and then you start typing, you get something. This is a prototype. So you type, see it says dev labs right there. So I can just type bundle and then hit, you know, it just sends me there right away. Nice. And then it's, it's in line now. So it's almost like popping down that thing there. You have, you have control comma now mm -hmm. on your system. And if you're following along, you can do the same thing. But you can also go up and search for the, uh, the inline navigate to, it's a prototype that they want you to check out. So I just typed in bundle. You'll notice over here in app start, that's actually where the bundle appears, bundle config. You'll see this when you go file a new project now. So there's a couple things here. We've got enable default bundles, okay? So that's going to go and bundle all the JS files in folders, like scripts and things like that. And that's just trying to make things uh, a little bit easier. So if I said something like uh, slash scripts slash uh, folder name mm -hmm. slash JS, then that would automatically bundle that up. So if I had a foo, I could say slash scripts slash foo slash JS. You know, one thing, just, just to get you off script already here is... Uh, Where is this a script? <laughs> I'm, I'm happy about the way that bundling and NuGet and all these things, uh, the way of managing JavaScript so that I don't have to worry about changing version numbers in my source if I want to upgrade JavaScript. That's so, a good you know, point. bundling, you, now you can just bundle, you can include a reference to a JavaScript or a jQuery bundle, and it's automatically going to just update. <laughs> so it's going to output when you, uh, you're... URL, when you include that link to that bundle, it's going to pull in the latest one and it's all going to magically work. Right. Well, if you think about things in the context of don't repeat yourself. Yes. Right. If I've got jQuery 171 or 182 or whatever here, I don't want to say it three times on every exactly. page. I just say jQuery star, put it all in a bundle and stop thinking about it. Yep. That's a good point. So here in bundle config, we've got enable default bundles, but I can also add different kinds of bundles. So I've got a script bundle here where I've said make my own. I, now I said at the location scripts slash magic. Now this is important to point out. So I said scripts magic, but you'll notice over here there is no scripts magic. What I'm saying is I wish that there were a place, <laughs> a URL called magic. Okay. Okay. And in that place called scripts magic would be all the JavaScript files from scripts bundle. See? So this doesn't really exist. And this is one of the things that web forms people have recently had to get their heads around because mm -hmm. MVC people know that what's in the URL doesn't reflect what's on the disk. Right. There's no it doesn't map to a file, ASPX file. It's just exactly. a it's a it's a method call or whatever. And even more now with bundling, in addition to uh, uh, friendly URLs, friendly URLs, we have to be reminded that that isn't the real place. Yeah. Okay. It's so magical. So scripts yeah, is magical. So I go scripts magic. I can hover over these. Here we go. There's scripts magic. So scripts magic. If I hit that URL, we've got slash scripts slash magic. Mm -hmm. And now notice that I've got two functions here, and they're all kind of all on one line. Foo one and foo two. Yep. Thing one and thing two. Thing one, two. Th so where are those coming from? Scripts bundle star.js. Okay. So that's these two files. And inside them is this. You'll notice that there's not just functions, but there's reference path stuff, and there's uh, summary information that I put for my XML um, commenting. All that's stripped out. Yeah. Okay? So that's the simple example. What's great about bundling is that you can pretty much go nuts and party on and do static bundles like this, where I just say, well, I want that file and that file and that file, mm -hmm. and it'll go and, and put them together in that order. Or I can do something like this. 
dynamic folder bundles. This is a little advanced, and this is where I think uh, this starts to shine. I'm going to say, I want to bundle, we're going to name it coffee, and then we're going to take star.coffee, and this here, coffee minify, is our code. We wrote this. Okay. This is not included. So you plug this in, so when that bundle is created, it's going to use your own magical coffee minify class, right. which is probably a ton of work. No. Well, let's check this out. So let's look at the, uh, at the overloads here. You see that? I bundle transform. Okay. So I just have to implement those kind of things. So let's take a look at the massive uh, work that Coffee Minify was. This okay. is using CoffeeScript. We'll talk a little bit about that in a second. This just derives from JS Minify, which is a, an I bundle transform. All I have to do then is then say process, and then I go and take the, uh, that thing that I want to bundle, I bundle it up, and I pass it up and say process it. So here we've just passed in the CoffeeScript compiler. But what's nice about this is because this is using JS Minify, we're going to compile the CoffeeScript into JavaScript and then call the base class and then continue the minification process. So it gets the JavaScript bundling or minification after that. Right, so we've basically kind of chained it in. Yeah, right? great. So let's take a look at that. So here's some CoffeeScript. Now you'll notice something funny here, and I'm sure that the lawyers will eventually make us get rid of that icon because it looks too much like Java. <laughs> and I don't know if that's steam coming out or if that's a straw going swizzle, in yeah. or a swizzle stick. I don't know. But this is something that Madge Christensen did. So you've got VS Web Essentials that we're going to talk a little bit about kind of throughout the day because mm -hmm. it sprinkles in everything that you do. So you've got the built-in web editor features in ASP or in uh, Visual Studio. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, we shipped new, uh, new editor features in... In 2012, August of 2012, we just shipped some more now, which is like mm -hmm. six months later or something. It's not, right. not that long after. So, but if you can't wait that long, if if waiting six months is too much, which in the web world it might be, then you get, grab this web editor, web essentials, yeah, and you can get these nightly if you want. Well, actually, right? that's a good point. Let's let's break it down for a moment, John. <laughs> let's look. I'm gonna look direct. This is I'm gonna look directly in the camera. I'm breaking right. the fourth wall. Okay. There, I probably so, use no. Yeah. Hello, people of Twitter. So. 2012 came out in August. Mm -hmm. August and, 15. Right. And then 2013 happened, the year. Like, you know, time marches on. Right. Okay. Uh, but there was a commitment made that we would go and update this in a more, in more often because the web moves faster than Visual Studio, in case you hadn't heard. <laughs> Did you know that? <laughs> Dude, there's just a new... Turns out. Yeah. No matter when we ship something, the next day a new version of jQuery comes out. So what we've done is we're coming up with updates. We're kind of committing to every six months-ish on the website. Official updates. Official right. updates. So this would mean, uh, like right now, you can get Visual Studio 2012. Then you can go and get update one. It improves a bunch of stuff. We call it 2012.1. Mm -hmm. We just released 2012.2. 2012.2 for ASP.NET includes all these kind of great tools. But for some people, that's not fast enough. Right. right? Every six months, not fast enough. Web Essentials is like our labs feature. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, if you have, like, on Gmail, you can go in and say, well, I love that feature and I love that feature. But they're not supported. Right. It'd probably crash your machine. Yeah. But you feel like, you know, oh, I'm testing labs features, right? But, but they're often kind of lightweight installs, right? They are. So you try a lab, and then if it doesn't work for you, you disable it or, or remove it. You, you expect a lab to be a pretty lightweight. Exactly right, yeah. as is the case with Mads' tools here. These are a kind of a collection of experiments that he and his team are coming up with, and these tools are easily disabled, they're non, no reboot install, it's very mm -hmm. simple stuff. But in 2012.2, we've graduated features, okay. features that we thought were, were great, they've now moved out of Web Essentials and into 2012.2 itself, like, for example, the less editor that we'll talk about. Okay. So, in this case, what I'm getting from Mads is the ability to double click on a CoffeeScript file okay. to get in, uh, I'm in, you know, IntelliSense in my CoffeeScript to some extent, but more the syntax highlighting. But I'm getting this split screen. So ability. So CoffeeScript. The idea with CoffeeScript, it is a lightweight language that compiles to JavaScript. Right. Now we're getting a little bit off. Yeah. Off in the weeds here, but I want to. We'll talk about this in a minute. Okay. But let's get, let's just. It's a language that compiles into JavaScript. Okay. Then we'll come back. Certainly. So, given that there is a language that compiles in JavaScript. And given that some web people want to use it, I could compile that at, um, at build time. I could build this into my build service. You know, I, do, I send it off to the build server. Maybe it's running a TeamCity or whatever, TFS, and I say build. 
batch file runs, and then CoffeeScript turns into JavaScript. Mm -hmm. Or as a web developer, I just like the idea that when I hit save, it updates. But if I've got CoffeeScript files sitting in a folder, why don't I dynamically bundle them up, compile them, minify them, bundle them all at once? And that's what we get to do here, and that's really cool. The idea being that uh, there are things you may want to express in JavaScript or also in things like CSS that the languages don't do well. Mm -hmm. So then you back up a level. You don't like CSS, maybe you'd like less, less compiles to CSS. You like JavaScript, doesn't feel right, maybe you use CoffeeScript, maybe you use TypeScript. How does bundling kind of fit into that? Well, there are bundle transformations, and if you want to plug in your own bundle transformation, you can. That's really cool. So if we look at that CoffeeScript file, all it's doing is it's saying, there's a function that takes x and then squares it. That's all it does. The left side there is kind of easy to read. The right side, oh, see, look, Mads has crashed me. Oh, Mads. <laughs> I've called him out. I'm going to probably disable that. OK. So let's see if this is still, let's actually see if that's still running. There we go. So here's the dynamic coffee script bundle. See what that just did? So I just hit scripts coffee coffee. OK. And, and that coffee this is JavaScript. That coffee in the URL, that was the, the name you defined for that URL. Right, right. For right. that bundle. Yep. Right. And actually, we'll go back over there again. This is the, yeah, the dynamic folder bundle was named coffee. Okay. And I pulled everything out of there. So all of these files down here in scripts, coffee, got pulled in. Okay. So this is a minified, bundled, and compiled bunch of CoffeeScript files served to the browser just as they should be. So that's really cool. The other thing that I could do is less. So less is great. And actually, I'll just take a moment and I'm going to disable my, uh, remember I told you I was running, it probably wasn't Mads, it was probably. Could have been that. Could have this been this is, guy. This is nice to, what, what you're showing <laughs> there though, is you're able to, uh, you can go in and disable things, enable and disable those really quickly. So I'll, I'll install you know, a nightly build of one of these and just throw it in, try it out. And then uh, if it doesn't work for me, I can uninstall it. Those v6 usually are just uh, zip file installs. So it just pulls them on down and, and uh, you know, really quick. Um, I'm hoping that our friends in the back are going to cut the mic when I start to cough. And if I just tip over, I guess the people on Twitter can just call the doctor. Right, right. right if you just see me like... There's probably a way right to... Right off the frame. You can probably call a doctor via Twitter. There's probably some Twitter to doctor feature. <coughs> is there a doctor on the tweet? <laughs> so less is another example of a language that is a kind of a, a domain-specific language. For example, here's some CSS on the right here that's got a bunch of repeated stuff. 10 pixels, 10 pixels, 10 pixels, 5 pixels, 5 pixels, 5 pixels. Right. And repeated stuff is never fun, right? Yeah. Don't repeat yourself. Because it gives you a lot of opportunity to make mistakes. You exactly. fix it in one place and then not, not another. And CSS, that's one of the, it's so repetitive, there's no way to define variables. There's no way to do any kind of calculations or any of those things. Exactly. It's super repetitive. It's very tedious. Mm -hmm. And bundling and minification is a great opportunity and a great time in the life cycle of your application to go and do that, that compilation. So the less editor that graduated is, uh, is now in 2012.2. And you can see on the left there that I've said uh, there's a little function. You can go and figure out how to, do, to do, do, how to do less. But we want you guys to understand that we can plug this stuff in to Visual Studio now right. in a way that works for you. So if I said you know, rounded corners 15, pass it in, that updates automatically over there. Now this is, uh, gives you a lot of choices. You can have this compiled at save time. Mm -hmm. Like I just hit save, you saw it update. I can actually go over here and notice that we've got a CSS file and then Web Essentials has made a, a min as well. So there's an example of minification at save time. Right. Or go back to bundle config, make a dynamic, dynamic folder bundle. Then we've got less minify. That gives you both bundling and minification, which is great. So let's take a look at that. See, less.parse. And this is actually using the dot less 
open source library. Okay, so again, to create your own bundle, a few lines of code, and you're just overriding what's already there and adding on just a little bit extra. Right, totally up to you. You've got behaviors you can change. In this case here, we've derived from CSS Minify, so you've really got a lot of choices. We really want people to feel like this is more than just a, a text editor. I mean, mm -hmm. I've got, you can see in my, here I've got Sublime Text, I've got Notepad 2. Right. You know, I do move around, I know, but I, I want to spend time uh, in a tool that's going to move things forward and, and prevent me from repeating myself. And I hate writing this kind of code. And when we get to the HTML5 section, mm -hmm. we're going to talk more about the improvements uh, in, in here. But speaking of CSS, we should probably talk about Page Inspector. Do you mind if I show that off? No, please. I've got, you know, I was thinking about this. I've got a cool demo here. Well, I've already been showing this uh, friendly URL segments and the friendly URLs with, with web forms. Hmm. So let's say I wanted to take a look at that default page, right? So I'm going to right click on default and I'm going to say view and page inspector. So what's important, the reason I wanted to show this off is because this is actually executing that code, right? So over on the left side, this is actually, this is coming from my database. So that's a huge thing. It's not just a, um, you know, a designer. This is actually going through and executing. I can see the live because your your live design time code is different. You know, JavaScript runs and databases get hit and all that. Mm -hmm. And then another feature. This has been in Page Inspector for a bit, but as you, you'll notice, as I'm moving my mouse along, you can see where things are coming from. So this is from that page. But if I go over to say this register link, say something mm -hmm. was going wrong there, I click on that. That's actually showing that this is coming from the site master, and it shows me where in the site master. And so, in, so hover over those again? So you, you just hover around? So I hit inspect, and then I just move around, and this is showing these are list items that are coming from that. Right. Now we're at a low resolution and you've got big fonts, but the right. idea here is that this answers that age-old question, what line of code made that HTML? Yes, yes. And I, I have, and I'm sure a, a lot of listeners have, I've spent days, <laughs> or I've spent many hours on a single bug trying to figure out where exactly did this bad HTML come from, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> trying to play detective on that. Well, a new feature I wanted to show off that's included in this 2012.2 release is this live update feature. So if I go into the uh, content and I bring up the CSS, right, so here's the body for that page. And if I go in, I could start changing and I can make this, you know, say green. And a live live updates means it updates on the fly, and I can say, well, you know, green actually. Oh, is hang on, you, you're cheating. You're cheating. You must be cheating. Are you saving? I'm not saving. No. So here, I just pick a color, pick another color. Show me in the show. Uh, bring that sites there. You see the sites uh, on the lower left corner there, where it says inherited. Sites Style, inherited. Yeah. Styles. Open that up a little bit. Is that updating too? You know, I don't know. I think it is. Okay. Let's see. Let's find out together. So, yeah, so let's change the body color there. Okay, so body color. Let's make this. Uh, oh, you're changing background. Change color. Color? Yeah. Uh, let's make this. Uh, no, make it white. Red? Whatever. Yeah, so look at that. So it actually highlighted. You see that the little flash there? It flashed. Whoa. Yeah, that's Let's probably say. not a good idea. <laughs> but there it is, right there, right? Right. But what, what I think is significant, though, is that there's, there's flashing and highlighting. And the idea is that when you come upon a, a new code base, mm -hmm. you know, you want to find your way around it. And you often ask yourself, well, how does this style affect that? And how does this partial right. view, you know, present itself in the HTML? And this allows you to explore all of that. And you know, getting that immediate feedback is something that I've found over my development career is huge. To be able to make a change and see how it works, that's a, a reason people do like test-driven development, is really to get that instant feedback on something. Exactly. Um, so here, for instance, you know, changing a color is something that's great to show um, you know, as a demo. But what about changing font size? That's, mm -hmm. that's something a lot more that I do a lot more often. So here, you'll see as I'm changing the font size on the right, in that CSS, it's updating quickly on the left. Um, so here I can, you know, start playing with fonts, and that's something I do all the time in CSS: is going and actually work on font sizes and try and get something that's going to fit in the area I've got. So there's quite a bit more to Page Inspector. Is there more that you'd like to look at, or should no? We... That's pretty slick. Okay. That's pretty cool. Um, do you want to? Uh, what else do we have? CSS. Are we good on this? 
<laughs> Are we good on this? I don't know. <laughs> um, actually, you know, I would like to talk about something a little more advanced. Let's talk about async. Okay. Is that cool with you? Yeah, we're good on time. Let's let's go for. And then we're going to come back. We're going to come back and talk about CSS and the new features and editors. How to make how to do HTML5 better. How to do CSS better. Some of the improvements. Uh, actually, one of the things. Check this out over here. You notice this? You can actually. You know how you, you know how in. Um, <laughs> you showed so, me see, that I'm, last I'm night. Totally I I'm totally it. geeking out. All right, this is random, but see this controller here. Yeah, they've they've merged in 2012 the class inspector and the the class explorer and the solution explorer. So here's a file. If I open it up. Here's a class. Open that up. Here's some methods. Mm -hmm. Okay. You see how amazingly colorful they are too. <laughs> so bright the colors. They're hurting my eyes. Yes, really. We need to take the color. The out colors are studio. screaming at me. So let's open up less. This is kind of an interesting use of. Um, of ordering in tree view here, we've got the less file. You can see the CSS it compiled to. Yeah. Then the dot min that that minified to. I can then open that in, up, and I can see on the CSS as I'm clicking, it's actually taking me there, and that's really great for a very large file. But I can also go and see mix-ins, variables, all sorts of stuff like that. Go right to them. Isn't that cool. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, just, it's very convenient. Not, not the most amazing demo when you have a very small number of things, but you know, as soon as you've got a, uh, uh, an application of any kind of complexity, mm -hmm. uh, where the CSS is kind of all over the place, very, very, very useful stuff, and a nice, uh, a nice example of uh, outlining. So let's talk async for a second, because this is something that is just beautiful. Um, and this uh, is something that my boss, Scott Hunter, showed me. So. Let me see. This is funny. Funny thing about ASP.NET now is you can't really tell what's web forms and what's not because sometimes it doesn't really matter. Okay, this is, looks like this is a web forms page. You've got the page load method there. Right. Yeah. So I've got my page load, and the idea here is that we're going to go and call some web APIs. Mm -hmm. And this is a real typical business task. Okay, the task is go get information from a bunch of disparate places. Right. That exist all over, and they might take different amounts of time to come back. I don't know. They're web services, right? Call that partner. Call this vendor. Call the mainframe. Get yeah. this from SQL Server. Go to the AS400. Or like a line of business app, you know, go get my order status, go get my uh, updates from, you know, whatever. Pull everything together, messages and exactly. all those things. Right. So in this example here, we're going to go and pull from a, a, a contacts API, get a bunch of names. Okay. We're going to also go and call a web service to get the temperature, mm -hmm. and then go and call an API and then do some kind of geolocation things. Very, very different things. Could take very amounts of time. So I put a stopwatch around it. Here's a stopwatch at the top. And then when it's done, okay, we'll uh, see how long that took. Then we'll just deserialize those from, with JSON.net, and we'll data bind them. Super basic, right? Let's take a look. But it's very typical. This is a very common thing for, uh, for people to do. So there's a little pause here as it fires up, but then we'll see for the actual work. And this is interesting because it's, it's synchronous. See, that took two and a half seconds. Yeah. Because we went and got all those things. And notice that the page didn't load. Nothing happened. So it, it went and got one, got right. the next, got the next. And every time you refresh the page, you've got to do that. You've got to right. wait So for it's those. taking a minimum of two seconds. Yeah. All right. That's because these guys here uh, just got in line. They're synchronous. Yep. I'm going to go and do that. And when that's done, I'm going to go and do that. So you basically take the amount of time it takes to do these things and add them up. Yeah. And that's about what your performance is going to be like. And you know, you may look at that and think, well, I'll do these asynchronously. But in the past, that's really hard. It's so hard to get synchronous code right in general. <laughs> yeah. and, and, this, and that brings up an interesting point about the difference between asynchrony and background tasks. Yeah. Threading and asynchrony are kind of different. But the idea, the idea is that is it reasonable for this thread to block just because I'm going off to go and get some file I.O. or talk to a database or do a web service here? So what I'm going to do is, rather than saying download string, we're going to say download string task async. Okay? And all of these different functions all over the place throughout the framework in 4.5 have added this task async or async versions. Mm -hmm. So things that you're already doing, getting strings, downloading stuff, have these asyncs. So we're going to go and add task async. 
This method download string returns a, wait for it, string. Uh, it's crazy. <laughs> what is string you, task got, async return? Uh, no, yeah, it's funny tasks, that you, you I know what you're going to point code. out. Notice that suddenly things that are totally different locations are getting uh, squiggly lines. Yes. See? I know that's bad. I don't know a lot, but I know that's bad. Yeah. The red squiggle. Most of programming is getting rid of squiggling, isn't it? <laughs> Probably not true, but nice to say. So this returns Red a squiggle refactor. Re that's nice. <laughs> I wonder if colorblind people see a gray squiggle. I don't know. Uh, task of string. So this no longer is returning a string. Okay. It's returning effectively kind of a promise to get you a string later. Right. A handle to a thing that's going off and going to get that string. Okay. And it'll let us know when that string comes back. Okay. So what that means is that these methods aren't going to go and take a, a second, take a minute and a minute and a minute or whatever, I suppose it's a second. They're going to go boom, 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 boom. They're all going to go out and do their thing. They're going to, well, this is a different, they're going to return immediately. Okay. They're going to give me a, they're going to give me an IOU. They're going to say, I owe you a string. I'll, I'll get that string for you later. Okay. Okay. So that means that no longer is client contacts a string. It is now a promise to get a string later. So down here, when I was grabbing client contacts, these methods are freaking out because they're like, I don't know how to get a string I'm from a task. task of string. Right. Instead, I have to ask that task for the result. Okay. This is the, uh, you know, take a number, come back later. Okay. So at the point those run, those have to, that's got to be completed. Right. It's got to have the string by that This point. needs to have happened at this point. Okay. So what we want to do is we want to go and say, uh, wait for all of them to finish. All right. Is it when all? Well, there's the difference. I mean, it's funny that you mentioned right. that. I wanted to okay. show you the difference. There's when all, and then there's wait all. So here is wait for them all to complete execution. See? Mm -hmm. Creates a task that itself will complete when all the supplies tasks ah, are completed. Ah, okay. So we'll say uh, client contacts and uh, client temperature. Let me see, client temperature and client And it's actually going to go out and take the temperature of my client. I don't know. I don't know. It's <laughs> probably not going to do that. Okay, okay. Okay. But it's going to do that. And here's the point. I need to wait for that okay. to finish. So I'm going to await on it. But that's notice how that, that, uh, for, that's that new keyword, the async and await. Right, but it's async gotta, and await. They're, they're friends. Right, they, they, they only work squiggle. together. Yep. See how he turned black? He's not yeah. blue. Okay. That's because he's not async. Now he's blue. Okay. So this function is now marked as async. He is going to be awaited on. But we're deriving from system.web.ui.page. We need to make sure that the page knows to be async. Right. This is it an, needs a bubble all the way up. The whole thing. So we've got async equals true okay. on that page. Okay. So this was a feature that's an ASP.NET 4.5 feature is to allow for the entire page to work with this async model. Exactly. So in, in, in just a couple of minutes here, I've taken something that I do all the time, mm -hmm. Change these ob you know, on an obvious low-hanging fruit, made them async. Used this task when all to wait around for it. Okay. And there's more sophisticated things you could do. You could say, you know, wait 10 seconds, and if that guy doesn't come back, then we're leaving without him. Yeah. Okay. There's different, different levels of, of, of complexity, as simple or as complex as you would like it to be. So then we'll fire this up. And there's, of course, there's the initial startup, but we'll hit refresh a few times to warm it up to make right, sure we right. get a real representation of how fast these things go. So now it takes a second. Okay, so all three of those things went out and did their thing. Right, and the difference here was the, was the concurrency. Mm -hmm. And then that thread that we're using is actually freed up to do other stuff. And that's really important. You know, that's what I've been told is kind of one of the, you know, so it's great in this, in this circumstance to be able to do three things at once, but mm -hmm. really that kind of async page method or async controllers in MVC, a lot of the deal is that you're not tying up those threads on your server. So if you've got a lot of things that are happening, happening um, you want to fire that off and you don't want the server to hold a thread open while you're waiting for this call. So you can make an async call and you can do this task-based async and the server is able to say like, okay, I'm, I'm not going to need memory or whatever, I'm just going to know I'm going to hear back from you later. And so I've heard that this is really you know, good for server resources. So. You know, you should think about async not just as a way of optimizing performance, but as optimizing the, the uh, resources on your server. You right. know what I mean? If you've you got want a lot to do as little as possible. Yes. And, but waiting counts as doing something you shouldn't be doing. Right. At the same time, anytime you have a thread that's just chilling, he's not working for you. So yeah. you want to put that guy back into the pool so that he can be used. 
And by saying await in async, you're basically marking that as uh, you guys have that handled. I'll go back and then you let me know when you're done. And it's actually building a whole state machine around that. Yeah. And it'll come back and pick me up and right, it's totally transparent. One thing, if you really want to be afraid, uh, compile something like that and then look at it in Reflector. Yeah, look at that MSIL or convert it yep. back to C Sharp and you see there is that whole state machine and it's doing all this work for you. Yep, so. exactly. Yeah. Cool. So those are just some of the things that are new in ASP.NET 4.5 and yeah, 4. If we, if we can come back to my slides, we'll, we'll take a look at the overview of what we've... Uh, and then see what's at. next. Yeah. Okay, so here we've got a, you know, we've talked about in web forms, we started with strongly typed data controls and model binding. So those ways that you can change the way that you uh, write your web forms, get closer, you know, it's a nice model, um, eliminates a lot of causes of error, eliminates all this left-hand, right-hand mapping and control binding and all that oh. kind of stuff. Uh, we looked at how friendly URLs not only help you make um, you know, nice, friendly-looking URLs, but also map those values from a URL or wherever into your controls. Uh, we looked at, we jumped over to Visual Studio for a while. We looked at Page Inspector and some things like where we're able to find out where, you know, what line of code generated what HTML. And then we looked at a new feature in Visual Studio 2012.2 that gave us live updates. So we were editing CSS and seeing it reflected immediately in the Page Inspector. Um, Scott, you showed us a bunch with uh, bundling, optimization, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And then also we see that async is, is kind of baked throughout the framework. Right. In this case, I was doing it inside of uh, web forms. You've also got async controllers and asynchronous stuff, not just in MVC and in web forms, but throughout. It's in web API. It's also in the entire framework. You right. can do these things in the console application. Yep. So uh, let me look here where, uh, where we're at. So we have just finished. Uh, we did the what's new, and we'll take a break. And then we'll be coming back, and we'll be talking about MVC4.